Welcome to Moments with Marianne. Allow me to interrupt your train of thought with something that may be one of the most interesting things you hear today. This is Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest Bailey Gaddis, and she's here to share with us her new book, Asking for a Pregnant Friend. 101 Answers to Questions Women Are Too Embarrassed to Ask About Pregnancy, Childbirth, and Motherhood. So let's welcome to the show, Bailey. Hi, thank you so much for having me. You know, it's always such a joy to spend time with you and to talk about your books. Yeah, I was actually really blown away kind of hearing that, you know, here we are, you know, 2021, and women are still having a tough time asking questions about pregnancy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like we've come a really long way, which is great. But there are still so many questions that women are embarrassed by, you know, and so much of that comes from our culture, (laughs) making a lot of these topics taboo. Um, So I still get so many questions, you know, whispered in my childbirth prep classes about all sorts of stuff that I can tell women are feeling so much shame around. So it's um, unfortunate, but I'm hoping this book can can help to provide, you know, really quality information and, and reduce that shame. Well, and I know that you're a doula as well, which, I mean, you're really immersed in this whole practice of helping women not only just know their bodies, but work through the pregnancy process. What are some of the questions that you get that are kind of the most common? Yeah, well, you know, one of the the biggest topics is, you know, the the emotions that come up during pregnancy. You know, it's like I, I get emails every week with women reaching out saying, I am so irritable. I cannot stand my partner, you know, and sometimes it's just a little little irritants, but sometimes, you know, women are really worried about this and they feel like, you know, should I, should I separate from my partner? You know, what's, what's going on? And, you know, so often it's our, our hormones <laughs> taking over. Sometimes it is a signifier of something bigger, you know, so those, those emotions can be a really big thing. And then of course, you know, after women have the baby, you know, there is postpartum anxiety, postpartum depression, postpartum OCD, you know, there's a lot of things that we don't realize can even happen. You know, postpartum depression luckily is is talked about more and more, but there's so many facets of that emotional journey in the first, you know, year of the baby's life that can really throw women for a loop and and make them feel like there must be something wrong with me. You know, um so I really try to yeah, support support with that because it's a it's a scary um can be a scary phenomenon to have really intense new emotions come up. Well, and especially when you don't really feel like you have anyone you can ask. I mean, that's got to be so difficult. And I was just blown away to see that there's so much, like women are carrying so much shame. Let's say they're hoping for, you know, one sex of a baby and they end up with a different gender. I mean, how, how do you talk with women about that? Yeah, well, luckily I have a lot of personal experience with that one. Um, When I was pregnant with my son eight years ago, I was convinced that he was going to be a girl, you know, and I, I built all these expectations about about what that would look like, about, you know, how I would parent a girl. And then at 20 weeks, when I found out that he was not, was not a girl, I felt devastated. You know, I had about three days where I I went through mourning. I mean, I and then of course I felt really guilty, you know, which I, as we do, guilty that I wasn't just grateful that he was a, a healthy baby. Um, and you know, so I worked I worked through that. I realized that you know I'm having the the child I'm meant to have, and that you know it really doesn't make a difference if the child is male or female. You're really not going to parent them any any different. So you know that's what I tell women that that face that same challenge and, you know, to not beat yourself up about feeling guilty. It is normal to have a a hope for one, you know, sex or, or another. So to just let yourself feel those emotions. And then on the other side of it, know that again, you're having the baby you're meant to have, and you will love them so much once they're in your arms. 
And if you've already painted the room pink, it's okay. You can paint it blue, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> All those things can be fixed. And I, I know, ma'am, women go through so much after having a baby, just through the birthing process and all of that. And they're, you know, you were talking about hormones raging. You know, what if they, you know, are one of the fears like, hey, I'm going to have my child and not really connect? Oh yeah. Well, that's, that's a big one, you know, because we always hear, oh yeah, you know, the moment the baby is in your arms, you'll feel this unconditional love and it'll just change your life. And sometimes that is the case, you know, sometimes you do have that, that instant bond, but it can be so incredibly normal for you to need some time to, to build up that bond, you know? And of course, you know, women freak out if they, they get the baby in their arms and they don't feel that instant connection. Um, sometimes they even feel some resentment in those early days towards the baby because they're, they're no longer sleeping and, you know, there's a lot going on. And again, going back to what I said, you know, before with women taking this as a sign that, oh, I must be a bad mom. I must be a horrible person. Um, but none of that is, is the case, you know, our, back to the hormones, they're, they're to blame for so much of this, but you know, our hormones are, are wonky after we have that baby and they can make it harder in some cases to, to bond with the baby. Sometimes they're on our side, you know, oxytocin, the love hormone that helps us bond, but sometimes those oxytocin levels don't rise and it, and it takes time. So I really want to remind women that even if they are somebody that doesn't feel that immediate bond, they don't immediately just love motherhood, that that is okay. And, and that bond will develop with time. Um, but of course, if somebody really feels like they, they can't care for the baby, like they are severely depressed, you know, obviously it is the best thing to, to reach out to your care provider and just let them know how you're feeling. Do you ever get women that say, you know what, I feel like just running away from all of this? No. Yes. Um, I, I have been that woman from time to time, you know, it's overwhelming. It is overwhelming having a new baby, you know, as, as the children grow, it can still be really overwhelming, you know, and especially, you know, when our role as a mother is coupled with, you know, our role as as a partner, as, as a friend, as a daughter, as somebody that, that has to work, you know, there is a lot on our plate and sometimes it can lead to that desire of just taking off for a while. And I, and I tell women, it's like, you know, if you have that desire, it, it likely does not mean you want to abandon your family. It probably just means you want to go to a hotel for an afternoon and sleep without anybody bugging you. Um, so yeah, so don't feel bad if you have that desire, of course, you know, if you really are feeling like you are drowning in motherhood <clears throat> again, seek, seek additional support, but, but a lot of times it's just so normal to feel like I would like to run away today. <laughs> I would like to go to the beach by myself. <laughs> I think all of us feel that way one day or another, right? <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. Kids or no kids. You know? Right, exactly. Well, and I mean, I, I you know, women just carry such a heavy load nowadays with work and children, and there's just so much that's on their plate. What are some of the, the common fears they tell you about their relationships, you know, as they're trying to juggle everything? Yeah, well, <clears throat> one that really surprised me specifically, you know, from pregnant women is I you know, I'm afraid that <clears throat> my partner is going to to stray when when I'm pregnant. And you know, when I first got that question, I would always think, oh, that's not going to happen. That's not something that happens during pregnancy. But then when I was writing the book, I started to research this question and I was really shocked to find that that research has shown that about 10% of partners do stray when they're, when their partner is pregnant. Um, you know, and I look deeper into that and the two primary reasons found were that, you know, number one, women physically probably aren't feeling great, you know, in, in different phases of pregnancy. And, and so sometimes, you know, physically they, cannot, you know, show up for their partner in the same way that they used to. And so sometimes that can lead to that infidelity. And then on, you know, looking at it from an emotional standpoint, 
women are dealing with a lot of a fear, anxiety, you know, a lot of different things that can come up during pregnancy. So they don't have a lot of space to, to support their partner in some cases with their emotional needs. So, so sometimes that can cause the, the infidelity, but of course, you know, I tell women, you're, you're not a statistic, you know, just because this is something that happens does not mean that that is going to unfold, you know, in your, in your partnership. Um, but of course, you know, communication is, is key, you know, so to just let your partner know how you're feeling and work through it together. Um, I'm, I'm 29 weeks pregnant right now. And so I am practicing what I preach (laughs) and there's, yeah, a lot of different things that have come up for me in regards to my, you know, relationship with my husband and just talking about it has provided the most relief. Well, congratulations. It's always exciting to have a new little one coming. So um, we're we're cheering you on here. And I mean, so it's really interesting with your book, you've been there, done that you've been on both sides, going through pregnancy, and then being, you know, the birth doula and, and helping people educate in regards to, you know, childbirth. Do you feel like women, when they say, hey, I'm, okay, so I'm going to get an epidural, but I'm kind of afraid because I may, you know, it may paralyze me. I may never walk again after it. Yeah, <clears throat> this is, you know, one of the biggest fears because, you know, you think about how an epidural is placed, you know, it's placed into fluid in the spine and that can sound really, really scary to women. And I, and I understand, um, the first thing that I say though, is that it is so rare, you know, the, the chances of it actually, you know, causing paralysis is, is very, very low. Um, but you know, and, and and to remember too, that, you know, anesthesiologists, they have an incredible amount of training they know what they're doing, but I always tell women, it's like, look, if you're afraid of that risk, but you're sure that you do want to get an epidural, have that conversation with the anesthesiologist beforehand. You know, I've had doctors that can even set up, you know, phone calls with a pregnant woman and one of the anesthesiologists at the hospital where she'll be delivering um, to ask her questions, to say, you know, what, what are the chances of paralysis? You know, what are the the signs to look out for? Um, And that's something else that can be important, you know, before the epidural is placed to ask the anesthesiologist, what, you know, what should this feel like? What should this not feel like? You know, for example, if their leg starts going numb, all of a sudden, like right as the needle is being placed, that's something that they should tell the anesthesiologist. So, so a good anesthesiologist will give the woman a list of, you know, if you feel this, let me know and we'll, we'll readjust. Um, But above all, knowing that again, actually being paralyzed from an, from an epidural is so rare. You might get a headache, you might start shaking. There's common symptoms of an epidural, but luckily paralysis is not one of them. Well, that's good to hear because it sounds like, you know, pregnant women have enough on their plate to worry about that as well, <laughs> you know, and, and do you find that, you know, with women that are going through like a natural childbirth, decide they're not going to use any medication, that there's also kind of a lot of fear as they get further along in their pregnancy? Oh, yeah. You know, because we have heard in, I mean, in our culture specifically that childbirth is the most painful thing you'll ever go through. And of course, you know, if you ever see a woman giving birth, you know, on a movie or TV show, she's usually like screaming and it, it's so scary, you know, so women that decide, okay, I, you know, I feel like medication isn't the right choice for me. You know, that, that does not mean that their fear of the, the discomfort of the pain goes away. And of course, you know, there's that fear of the unknown. You know, you don't know if you've never had a baby before, you don't know what it's going to feel like. So yeah, women go into it questioning, well, can can I do this? You know, will the pain be too much for me? Um, and of course, every woman is is different. I, I went into the birth experience with my son knowing that I didn't want medication, but also not knowing if I would be able to, to manage the discomfort. Um, and I think I did ask for the epidural once or twice, but uh, everybody just kind of ignored me. And I... <laughs> 
I continued on and (laughs) and I had a really fast, I had a really fast labor um, relatively. So there really wasn't time anyways. Um, And I, and I got through it, you know, um, it was not easy, but yeah, you know, I think women should know that that uncertainty, um, even some anxiety around, you know, can I do this or not without medication is, is normal. Um, and I really encourage women that, you know, are planning on an unmedicated birth, you know, if they get into a situation during childbirth where they feel like, you know, medication is the right choice. You know, they're not being pressured by anybody else, but they feel like that is the right choice for them to not feel any shame around it, to not feel like they're not strong or they didn't try hard enough. You know, sometimes for whatever reason, that pain medication is needed and there's nothing wrong with that. I I would agree with that. I think every, every childbirth is different. And so do you find that women typically will have like a plan B if they're going to go natural and then go, well, you know, just in case I'll, I want to talk to my doctor about a plan B. Yeah. You know, honestly, a lot of women don't. Um, and I, uh, I encourage the, the women that take my classes to have that plan B, you know, it's one of the first things I say in my classes. It's like, look, a lot of people take this class, you know, wanting to have an unmedicated birth. Um, and this will totally prepare you for that. But I want you to know that if you need a plan B, if, you know, things change that that's okay. And so I work with women on, on developing that plan B like, okay, let's say that you need to be induced, for example, you know, what would you want that to look like? You know, what medication would you feel comfortable with? If you end up needing pain medication, what would you want? You know, would you want the epidural? Would you want something else? You know, so I really do try to help women look at a lot of the different possibilities without scaring them, of course. Um, So if something comes up, they they do have a plan because it can be really overwhelming during childbirth. If suddenly, you know, your blood pressure is spiking and the, the, you know, doctor is saying, well, I think an epidural would actually help with this, but you hadn't been planning on an epidural. And so, yeah, I think a plan B is a really great option. And, and one thing I would say is that having a plan B does not mean that you're not dedicated to plan A, that you're not going to do what you can to make that happen. But if that plan needs to be changed, that is okay. That sometimes is just the nature of childbirth. It is unexpected. Yeah, you don't really know what you're going in for, you know, I don't think anyone does, you know, because you can go in and say, Hey, well, I'm going to have a natural birth and end up being in labor for like two days. Exactly. Yes. Ooh, that would be a little rough. Well, and you know, a lot of times you hear like when, you know, you women are in their pregnancy, they're kind of concerned about noise around them. You know, is that something that they need to factor in? Like if their arguments are in their loud environment? Oh, yeah. You know, and this can especially be an issue in the hospital because, you know, out in the hallway, sometimes people are talking really loud and, you know, maybe you've you've gotten into the zone, you know, you're meditating and then all of a sudden you hear somebody out in the hallway saying who knows what or even in the room, you know, maybe the the doctor and the nurse are having this loud conversation about something that has nothing to do with you. So yeah, there can be all sorts of, of conversations, noises that can take you out of that, you know, quote unquote zone, you know, so I encourage women to do two things. Um, Bring earplugs to the birth, especially if you will be in the hospital. If you just don't want any sound, you can pop in those earplugs. Um, And then to also have, you know, a few playlists on, on your phone, some guided meditations that you can listen to and bring some earbuds. So you can have that private listening experience. You can just block out all, all of the noise around you because, you know, even a home birth, you know, there's just going to be noises that distract you. So having some strategies to, to block all that out can be really helpful. So what if someone has a friend that just can't get pregnant they've been trying, how does someone share their pregnancy with them? Great question. Yeah. You you know, this is something that I've experienced from, from both sides. Um, it took me a really long time to get pregnant with this um, baby that I'm currently pregnant with. I had a, a miscarriage, um, you know, about eight months before getting pregnant. So I, 
Yeah. So I've been on both sides. Um, and how, how to share that news, you know, you have to be really, really gentle. Um, and you really have to take kind of your, your own emotional needs out of it, you know, because when you're pregnant, you know, you are in this, this beautiful, joyful space, you know, that thing that you wanted to happen has happened. You are there, but the woman that you're telling, she is still struggling with it. You know, she, like you have the one thing that she wants most in the world. So I really encourage telling her in a very gentle way and letting her know up front that like, look, I, I'm going to tell you this news, but I do not need you to, you know, feel overjoyed. Like I totally understand if this is, if this is triggering, if this even makes you somewhat angry, you know, to just give her the space to feel however she needs to feel, to give her permission to not have to, to fake excitement, you know, and sometimes, you know, genuinely the person you're telling will be excited for you, you know, but she also needs permission to to be sad, to maybe feel a little bit of jealousy or resentment, um, because that is normal. And, and above all, to not take it personally. You know, if that loved one that you're telling isn't overjoyed by your news, it's not because she doesn't want you to have a healthy pregnancy. It just means that she so badly wishes that she could also be there with you. Um, so yeah, to just be really, really gentle and understanding about, about her emotions. That it's still okay to tell them and you just have to be very mindful in the way that you do it. Yes, yes. You definitely don't want to keep it from them. That, that's the other thing. You don't want to tell everybody else, but then just postpone telling that that friend. Cause again, in the days of social, the day of social media, and and again, people talk, people share happy news. Um, so it's much better if it comes from you in a in a gentle, loving way. Why do you think women in general are just so afraid to ask these type of questions or so, you know, get to a place of such shame to, to even ask these questions? Because a lot of this um, would seem like it's kind of, I wouldn't say common sense, but when you're going through that entire process, I would, I'm sure all these questions come up. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's two parts, you know, like I mentioned before, our, our culture has made you know, certain topics taboo, you know, so anything, you know, really related to, to sexuality and pregnancy can feel really taboo. But, but on top of that, you know, a lot of the questions that, you know, we feel embarrassed about or, or shame around, they're the questions that make us really examine, you know, our, our emotional landscape, you know, what, like things about our body that might make us really embarrassed. So it, it really makes us do a deep dive into, into who we are, into the, the challenges that we face. And, and that can feel really overwhelming. That can feel really scary to take this, this honest look at it, who we are, which is why with a lot of these questions, women don't even, and I'm speaking from experience, you know, don't even realize that they have the questions until they read them. You know, for me, when I was writing this book, there was a lot of questions. I thought, oh, well, that wasn't really something that was a concern for me. But then when I started to get into it, I realized, oh my gosh, yeah, this was a concern I had, but I was just too embarrassed to even admit it to myself. Um, so it, yeah, it can trigger a lot that I think, and I think it can be a really beautiful opportunity to get to know ourselves on a deeper level, but it's a lot of work to, to really dive into, to all this stuff. So I was hoping that the, the book could serve as a bit of a guide, you know, it's like, here's, here's where to start with, with exploring all of these strange, wonderful, challenging topics. Well, it makes it a perfect gift for a friend who's pregnant because I mean, I'm, I'm reading through this and it's like, gosh, all these seem like they would be questions people would want answers to. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's certainly the hope. <laughs> do you do you find that there's any hesitation when pregnant women are in labor and they're in the, del the delivery room about having their partner in there as well? Sometimes, yeah, that, that can be a big thing, you know, because uh, every partner, you know, processes the birthing experience different, you know, because you are seeing 
this, this woman that you love go through a really intense experience. And even though, you know, the pain, the discomfort is normal, it's supposed to be there. That can be really scary for partners. Um, if you are in the hospital, you know, some partners have a lot of fears about the hospital. I had a dad that passed out <laughs> when the, his wife had to have uh, some blood drawn during her birthing experience, you know? So yeah. So if you have a partner that has a lot of anxiety coming up during the birth experience, the birthing woman is going to, to feel that energy. So every now and then it it's intense enough where, you know, and I work with, with couples on this, on deciding if, you know, having that, that partner in the room during the birth is the best option. A lot of times it is. And we find strategies to help to make sure that, that the partner is, is okay. And staying calm and, you know, doulas are really great at that. You know, we help the partner almost as much as the mom. Um, but every now and then, again, if the partner really feels like, I don't think I can, you know, put my anxiety to the side, I think that I will really freak out. Then in that situation, it might be best for them to wait until the baby is born to, to come into the room. Yeah, in case you have people passing out, right? <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. The, the woman is the one that needs the attention, not the partner who doesn't like blood. <laughs> yeah, who just passed out, you know, they're having to triage that person now. <laughs> so, exactly. <yeah. laughs> oh my goodness. Well, yeah, I know your book is filled with so many great tips. What would you want our listeners to take away from this book? Yes. So number one is know that nothing that you feel or think during pregnancy, during childbirth, during early motherhood makes you like abnormal or bad. You know, this is a really wild, unexpected journey. And just know that whatever comes up for you is normal and you, you can navigate it. It doesn't mean that you're a, a bad, weird person or anything like that. Well, that's good to know because no one wants to be a bad or weird person, especially when you're having kids. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's so much going on and, you know, the hormones are raging a lot of times, you know, um, you know, when someone's pregnant, I understand that they really just don't even can't really stand to be around anyone, including their partner, you know? So. Oh yeah. That's all of that is so normal. Well, that's good to know. My goodness, Bailey. I mean, we could talk forever. I love your books. Where can our listeners connect with you, learn more about your work, and be part of your community? Yeah, so the best place is on my website, baileygaddis.com. That has links to, you know, all the books, my blog, social media. You can um, email me directly from there. So that's, yeah, the, the best place to start. Well, Bailey, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you, Bailey. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Asking for a Pregnant Friend. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.